This summer, as Catholics across the country stand up for their religious liberty, we thought it might be nice to feature bookmarked episodes from years past that deal with the faith of our founders and the first of our First Amendment rights. We hope you enjoy the following interview from our archives. And welcome once again to EWTN Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host today. Our author is Mr. Michael Novak, and the book is on two wings, humble faith and common sense at the American founding. It is published by Encounter Books. Welcome, Mr. Novak. Good to be with to you, Doug. Our, our little Happy bookmark show here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to have you here on the, on the program. I've, uh, I've seen you speak many times before on television, and uh, our viewers uh, would have seen you recently probably on Raymond Arroyo's program, The World Over, but where else would they have seen you and maybe heard your name before? Uh, Brian Lamb did a show on book notes uh, okay. uh, not so long ago and okay. might have seen me there. This is the first time I'm on, I'm on site. I think I've been on satellite or right, tape Right, that's true on EWTN. Every that's true, is, right. But this is the first time we got you in the studio I, here. First time I've been down. It's really impressive. Okay, uh, great. It's a much, much bigger operation than I imagined. Right. Well, it's very nice to have you here and, and to be talking about a book on two wings. And it's interesting because... There does seem to be a lot of debate we hear uh, in the secular media about the founding fathers. You know, maybe the, uh, the people would say, well, the right wing people say all the founding fathers were Christians. And the more academics say, well, they were either some form of deist or they really were enlightenment people. Uh, is, that, is that that debate that prompted you to, to go forward in looking into what the truth really was? Yeah, a, a little bit of it. There's been a concerted effort in the last 50 years or so mm -hmm. to drive religion underground, mm -hmm. Christianity, Judaism particularly, and to drive it out of the public square, mm -hmm. make it a private uh, matter. And, and to suggest that religious people are somehow illegitimate, uh, okay. you know, dangerous, divisive, whatever. And that seemed to me just plain wrong. It didn't match what I had read in the founders. I, I'm not a historian, mm -hmm. so I had to go and do some work and keep working. I started this, was asked to give some lectures in 1987 at Notre Dame on the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. Right. And um, uh, those lectures were pretty successful, but I wasn't happy with them. So I've just been accumulating files, reading mm -hmm. more, studying objections. Mm -hmm. The deist, no, that, that's a lazy way of man's way of talking about the founders. I think historians say that because most historians are not very religious. Right. And therefore they don't think that that it was very important to the founders. It just doesn't interest them. And, uh, and it is true that at a good number of the founders, if you take just the top 100, the guys who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, that's about 82 or 83. Mm -hmm. Some overlap, some did both. Right. And then throw in Abigail Adams and uh, Tom Paine and George mm -hmm. Mason and Patrick Henry, some who didn't sign either one, but were very important. And you have about 100. Right. Now, of those, a, a, a small number, but an important number, Jefferson, were not Orthodox Christians. Uh, Franklin was not sure he believed in the divinity of Jesus. Right, right. Um, um, but most, most of them were Christians. However, when they spoke of God, particularly in official documents, they almost always used the Jewish terms for God. Right. Almost never Trinity, Redeemer, Savior, although the Constitution does mention Year of Our Lord. Mm -hmm. And it does mention, you know, in the veto, it right. excludes Sunday, so that's a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, you know, they, they gave to God what's God's and to Caesar what's Caesar's. The, the Constitution is not a religious document, it's a political document. Right. But in the Declaration of Independence, four names of God, the author of nature and nature's laws, mm -hmm. creator who endowed on us our rights, um, supreme judge of the rectitude of our consciences, because they were appealing to the common sense of mankind that, look, we're not rebellious. We're not engaged in sedition. All we're doing is asking the king to respect the rights due to Englishmen. Mm -hmm. He's the one in violation, not we. Right. So don't call us seditious or rebellious, and let God be our judge. And then finally, providence, right. with a firm reliance on divine providence. These are all Jewish names: Creator, Judge, Providence. Th that's not Greek or Roman. Right. It's not the Enlightened God. Right. It's not the Deist God. Mm -hmm. So I, I think Deism is it won't work. Right. 
Well, right in the beginning, one of the quotes that strikes you is uh, a quote from John Adams who said, I will insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. Yeah, and he goes on to say that's because they gave the human race an idea of truth. Mm -hmm. And there is a God who, who, who understands everything and who put intelligibility in everything, so he understands it, even if we don't. Mm -hmm. And that means when you're faced with a doubt, is it this or is it that, you can examine the evidence. It, you know, it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, both can't be right sometimes. And we may not be sure which one, but you can examine the evidence and argue from the evidence. That makes civilized discussion possible. Mm -hmm. If there's an ideal truth, you and I can argue. You may have part of it, I may have part of it, and we can make some progress by the end of the day. Right. And uh, barbarians club one another. Civilized <laughs> people argue. Well, hopefully. And so civilization, right. you know, Thomas Aquinas said civilization is conversation. It's right. reasonable people discoursing. Right. And that, that's Adam's point. It's a very sound point, I think, and I think he's right. Uh, we owe that to the Jewish tradition. Uh, yeah. Christians took it from there. Was that also something that, and I think you say in the book, because obviously there were multiple Christians from multiple denominations, it gave them one thing that they could always go back to in common, a common language, a common understanding. Yeah, I, I think that's one reason they, they preferred the Hebrew language. It saved arguments between the Unitarians and the Anglicans and the Baptists and, and the Congregationalists and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, that's true. But also, they identified with the people of Israel. Be they often refer to America as the second Israel. Right. Okay. In fact, Jefferson's commission to the group that was drawing up the, um, the seal of the United States, the Congress's uh, uh, directions, was to have a representation making this link explicit between Israel and today. And thus, I think you still see that the, the symbol, the, the pyramid, which can only be from Egypt and the kind of desert, it, it suggests the wandering. Right. But anyway, um, the, the, other, the original version was even more explicit, the fire by night leading them. Uh, right, yeah, as you describe yeah. in the book. And, uh, well, it's interesting, you mentioned Unitarian. Now, many people watching the network today, certainly in today's context, would think, well, Unitarian is like not believing in anything. And, and Jefferson, well, you mentioned, was Unitarian. Was it different back then when people were no, quote-unquote Unitarians? Uh, well, no, you, Unitarians you know, have a strong belief in, uh, in reason mm. and the God, the God who can be discovered by reason and, and uh, respect for the divinity. It's very simple, very stark, like some New England churches. Right. Um, but... Uh, and, and, and Jefferson was like that, but Jefferson was more, because Jefferson quite often wrote of providence and judge. Uh, he, did, he did declare himself in his private writings a Unitarian, thought the whole country would be Unitarian by the end of his life. Mm -hmm. He was wrong about that. Right. But like I say, he was probably the least religious, the least orthodox of the founders. But by contemporary standards, he was no atheist. Right. Uh, he was a believer in God, providence, judge, and um, and uh, there's there's a lot of content there that you don't find in the ordinary newspaper or television discourse of today. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. The largest church service in America during his administration was in the U.S. Capitol building. And at right. Jefferson's orders and by his desire and express command, the music was paid for by the federal government. He supplied the Marine Band every Sunday because he thought it was so important. And he often attended. Right. Um, where was the ACLU when we needed them? You know, where, where were <laughs> right. they? Yeah. Okay. Right at the beginning. Well, well, how does someone then go back and is it because people just ignore what the facts are or has there been a, and you talk a bit, little bit about it without jumping ahead, about different ideas of why we ended up where we are today with this kind of really improper view of who these people were and what they really believed. Well, it's, it would be a long argument in itself, and I don't get into that in the book because um, I really just wanted to bring out mm -hmm. the story of then. I wanted to tell that as thoroughly as I could. And I wanted to emphasize public documents, decrees of the Congress. For instance, right after the Declaration, uh, there was a terrible first few months of the war. The Americans lost the Battle of Long Island, lost New York, right. Manhattan, lost New York lost all of New Jersey, retreated by wintertime to Valley Forge, uh, and uh, the Congress uh, urged every state to have one national day of uh, humiliation and fasting. Right. Uh, 
on December 11th. And to plead, I'm paraphrasing, uh, plead of Almighty God the forgiveness of the manifold sins of Americans of all ranks. All right. And ask his blessing on this present just and necessary war. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, they, Britain had such a great army. Britain had such a great navy. We had no army. We had right. no navy, a very small army, no navy, and um, no munitions factory. Um, we couldn't prevail without God's help. Mm -hmm. A betting man would not have bet on the Continental Army. Would, would and, not have bet. No, in some ways, revolution. that's part of my point. It, while the founders were exquisite human beings of reason, they really struggled to, to make reasonable arguments about what they were doing and mm -hmm. make their case to humankind, make it to one another, put through a little bit later the Constitution based on reasoned argument, persuasion. They were people of reason. At the same time, it wasn't entirely reasonable what they did. Right. And they only did it because they believed that the God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time, as Jefferson said, and that the God of liberty would not abandon, mm -hmm. is not likely to abandon, a people who committed themselves to liberty. Mm. He might, you know, uh, they knew from the story of Jesus that life is not a morality play. Right. The good don't always win. Right. They sometimes get beaten down pretty terribly. So it's, it's, they knew they had no guarantee, but they had a chance. Right. And that's, that's what they banked on. And I know one of the things, the way you, you lay out the book, and one of the things at the end, you kind of list all the, the major founding fathers you talk about, and, and actually what they suffered, in a sense, oh. because of uh, buying into and participating yeah. and supporting and fermenting this revolution. Uh, you know, uh, half a dozen of them had to flee their homes because the British made a special set of detours to go take their homes, mm -hmm. you know, when they were marching in one direction or through New Jersey or other places. Um, a couple deaths and right. very severe illnesses because of hiding in the woods and things like that. Um, some lost sons in the, in the uh, army. A couple of them were captured in the Battle of Charleston in, in South Carolina. Right. And um, um, a good many had their properties right. burned to the ground everything stolen. Well, well, I know one of the stories has to do with, uh, was it Major General John Warren, mm -hmm. uh, what is that, Battle of Bunker Hill, yeah. and, and just with the idea of him, what he gave up and what he did, and he suffered, and after he was killed, he was decapitated, and his head was given to, to General, General Gage. Hat, yeah. General Gage. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about that today, it sounds like the way someone would treat a terrorist. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, in Afghanistan well, or British, something like that. The British took an awful beating that day. They, they really had disdain for the Americans. They weren't a trained army. Right. The British were trained to march, and then one unit would kneel, and right. there'd be two rows behind them. They'd just send a wall of lead. Right. And most armies couldn't withstand that. That lead would just cut a hole, and they'd, right. they'd go through it. And um, the Americans had fortified Bunker Hill silently overnight, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the British were surprised to see it. They laid right. down a bombardment all morning for five or six hours, then they assaulted with 3,500 men. Right. And uh, the Americans only had about five shot apiece. So they had to save their ammunition. But they were marksmen. Mm -hmm. And when they shot, they hit. Right. So when the British advanced, they, the Americans held their fire. And when they let go, um, they sometimes took down as many as 70% of the front rank of the wow. British. Right. And by the end of the day, the British had lost a thousand men. That's a lot of men to lose in a battle. Right, especially against and, uh, men rabble. So they were a little, mind. they were a little rattled themselves. Right. Uh, it seems. And uh, Major General Warren had just been appointed Major General. Right. Rode into the ranks and without taking command, he just because he rode all the way from Worcester when he found out about it, having just received his command, and he just put himself in the front ranks. Right. Shot through the head. Right, and, and before we go, we'll have to mention Breed's Hill, of course, because otherwise somebody will be writing us a letter about <laughs> <Get> Bunker <it>. Hill. <laughs> We're speaking here with Mr. Michael Novak, author of On Two Wings, Humble Faith and Common Sense at the American Founding. It is published by Encounter Books. Much more on this topic right after this quick break. And thank you for staying with us here on EWTN Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our author, again, is Mr. Michael Novak. And on two wings, humble faith and common sense 
at the American Founding is the book. Uh, you write right at the beginning of the book, you make this statement, I pray that the American people shall keep our end of the covenant with our Creator. What covenant is that? The very first thing the Continental Congress did when they first, the first day they met, September 7, 1774, gathering in Philadelphia, was ask for a day of prayer. The British, they had a report, had landed in Boston mm -hmm. and were pulling people from their homes and burning some places. Uh, it turned out not to be a true report, but they met to make a petition to the king, all the colonies together, look, we don't want rebellion. Mm -hmm. We are your subjects. We don't belong to parliament. Pull off the taxation. Deal with us directly. Keep your promises. And all of a sudden, they found themselves, they thought, at war. So Sam Adams, who was the strongest spirit for independence, said, um, I move that we open this Congress with a prayer mm -hmm. to ask the guidance of Almighty God in our necessities. And there was a squabble. We can't all say the same prayer. Baptists and Unitarians mm -hmm. can't say the same prayer. And um, Jay and Rutledge from New York and Carolina. And uh, uh, Sam Adams said, uh, I'm not a bigot, mm -hmm. and I'll, ex I'll listen to the prayer of any man, so long as he's a patriot. And he said, I understand Reverend Duche next door, Christ Church, is such a man, and I move that he be asked to lead us in prayer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So he came, and he read the 35th Psalm. Now, later on, Franklin and some of the others called to their minds that they began by asking God's help and their necessity. And I read the Declaration of Independence as is, is a kind of covenant of that sort that our rights begin in God, we appeal to him for the rectitude of our intentions, we place our cause under his pr providence and we depend on his help. And then Washington said every day when he was named commander in chief, the army should line up and be led in prayer right. by the commanding officers. The officers should be present, there should be chaplains appointed to every unit. And he instructed his men, no profanity. Now, I don't know how an army mm -hmm. functions without profanity, right. Doug, but that's, that's what okay. he said. And, um, and uh, because they had to be a special kind of army. Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't antagonize the people. They had to represent the... So, so I think what they understood themselves is they were committing themselves to a cause for liberty, which they believed God had commissioned them with, and they counted on his defense. Even Tom Paine, in the, in the terrible days at Valley Forge, um, wrote in his, his, his um, letter to the colonies, mm -hmm. uh, 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 his, his open letter in the revolution, his report on the revolution, that these are, these are wintry days. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not the time for summer soldiers. And, he's, and then he, he goes on to say, you know, I, I'm not a believer, everybody knows that, but right. I'm not so much of an infidel that I think God will abandon the people who have committed themselves to liberty, um, you know, as he directed us. And, or, or, or that he'll let the King of England get away with this. Um, so, so even Tom Paine made this appeal. Right, because he's the one, I mean, uh, there are societies named after him and uh, that are all very, you know, rationalistic, focused well, simply Well, he was. He, his, his religion was reason. No, right. He don't, made no bones about it. And he said, look, I'm not a Catholic, I'm not a Presbyterian, I'm not a Congregationalist, I'm not a Jew, I'm not, I'm not any religious believer. My religion is reason. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But he also took ship to France in 1789 mm -hmm. to beg the French to abandon atheism because he says, if you give up God, you will give up your rights, the grounding of your rights, and you will end in bloodshed and anarchy. And, and they, they pretty much did. Mm -hmm. And they threw him in jail for it. And there he penned some marvelous words on uh, meeting his judge mm -hmm. on his own expectations of immortal life. And so he, you know, he, 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 he was... He, you, you might call a deist, except for this right. belief in judge, right? Uh, in his own way, in providence. Um, so he's certainly no orthodox uh, Christian, right? But he's not an atheist in the contemporary way. But but that's the point too, because sometimes in the terminology, people would say, you know, he's not a believer. Well, well, he wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ, maybe, but that that's doesn't mean right. he didn't believe in a higher power. He did not accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That's true. And that's, pr that's probably true of Franklin. Right. It's probably true of Jefferson. Mm -hmm. It may be true of Madison. Mm -hmm. um, but I think most of the others were uh, uh, Christians of some degree of devotion or other. Maybe nine or eight or nine of them had studied for the ministry. 
I had planned to be ministers, and then for various right. reasons, sometimes necessity went into the law. Many were were so learned in discussing theology that their pastors wrote letters about how inspired they were by conversations with them. Right. And uh, so it was quite a remarkable bunch. Uh, right. I, I don't want to say they... I, look, one other thing I want to make clear. One mm. reason I call this a, a book on humble faith is that they all discovered that there are many faiths in America, Christian faiths mostly, mm -hmm. Jewish and Catholic too, but not so many. And they all had to learn that their faith could not be supreme over the others. That there had to be liberty of conscience for others. So they all had a... To that extent, they learned to have a humble view regarding the other, and they didn't want to establish a creedal country in which you had to pronounce a faith in order to be a citizen, except one faith. You do have to believe in Republican government. Right, right. You have to believe in a republic. That's what we pledge allegiance to now. Right. And uh, that's written into the documents. But as you say, at the same time, uh, the states and different states at different times had those kind of established religions. Well, actually in several of the states, at least five of the original 12, had established churches. Uh, Virginia had abandoned its, but uh, five of the others did, including Massachusetts. And uh, when it came time to, to do the Bill of Rights, it was the Baptists of Southern Virginia who mm -hmm. were probably the most influential group in seeing to that there was a Bill of Rights. Right. Uh, because a lot of people didn't want to sign the Constitution, didn't want to vote, ratify the Constitution unless it had a Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. So they ratified it provisionally, you might say, in the expectation that a Bill of Rights would be added. Would be added to it. And Madison had a very grueling election that campaign because Patrick D Henry was angry at him, governor, and redistricted him. Okay. So that he had a whole <laughs> new constituency. Familiar. He had okay. a whole new constituency to face. Uh -huh. But a lot of them were Baptists, uh, uh, almost half. And uh, Madison had worked very hard to support the Baptist, even though he was an Anglican, because uh, the Baptists had been treated with such cruelty. On one occasion... You have a, that story, right. Yeah, in a farm not far from his. John Noonan told this story. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned it mm -hmm. from uh, in his wonderful book, The Luster of Our Country. Um, uh, a Baptist preacher was preaching in a pasture. And it was like this, like a natural amphitheater, because they didn't have microphones, mm -hmm. to about 3,000 or 5,000 people. And an Anglican posse rode up. And the leader took the butt end of his whip, bull whip, and plunged it into this preacher's mouth while he was preaching. And two other men got off their horses and tore the man's shirt off, and they ga gave him lashings right in front of everybody and carted him off to jail. Mm -hmm. You know, something like 30... Baptist preachers were in jail for preaching without a license. And of course, their objection was, uh, we don't get our license from the state. Um, our license comes from God. And, uh, and Madison thought, you know, this is not really, religion should not be enforcing things like this. And he, so he, he chastised his own fellow Anglicans and, and tried to bring about a disestablishment of religion there. Right. But several of the other colonies had establishments. And the Baptists made him promise when he went back to the Congress that he would bring about a Bill of Rights. He said, no, we don't want a Bill of Rights because all our rights are protected in the Constitution. The only powers the government has are those that are written down in the Constitution. And we didn't give them power over religion. Mm -hmm. So they're, you're protected. And they said, no, we don't trust the Anglicans. We want it written down. Right. And he said, well, look, if we start writing down rights, it's going to weaken the whole thing because people will come to believe over the, cent over the generations that the only rights we have are those that are written the ones down. The that are there. You yeah. have all your rights. Uh, don't write them down. Don't make it a finite list. And they said, we want them written down. So he promised. And uh, so we owe the Bill of Rights more to the hmm. Baptist Jerry Falwell's ancestors in Virginia right. than anybody else. It's one of the great ironies of, right. uh, of our history. And they wrote, that, they wrote that First Amendment through argument um, it's a dis complicated discussion, and I try to follow it in the book. I give the six right. different versions. A couple of different versions. Yeah, that, six different right, versions. Right. So you can see very clearly what they wanted to get at. And the last version ends up, Congress shall make no law. They didn't want Congress making law about religion mm -hmm. or, or the press. They, they just wanted to take that out of the hands of the Congress. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Mm -hmm. Neither establishing one nor disestablishing the ones that then existed. That belonged, religion is the business of local communities, of the states, of, of villages, of families. It's not the business of the federal government. That was the idea they had. You need religion as a pillar 
of our way of life, of our Republican form of government. And when they said religion, they meant Judaism and Christianity yeah. okay. at that time. Right. And it remains to be seen whether Buddhism and Islam, Hinduism, the other religions that are coming here in greater numbers, mm -hmm. whether they can also develop a philosophy of liberty. I think that's happening, right. just as it has among Catholics. Another point you make in the book is to show that a lot of people would say, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers and Locke and the social contract, those things, those are really the massive underpinnings of what was going on with these early documents of, of our country. But you relate it in some ways more to like the Mayflower Compact approach. Well, um, it, this is also a complicated discussion, Doug. Um, it's necessary to, to avoid some extremes here. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, for the last 100 years, political theorists and historians have put so much weight on the Enlightenment thinkers, on Locke particularly, and Hobbes and the others, mm -hmm. that they've forgotten about the biblical element in the founding. Um, those days of fasting and humiliation, the days of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. These are official acts of the government, the command to pray in the army, and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about the private views of the, right. of the founders, although those are uh, powerful, but about their public actions as a people that they took as a people. Mm -hmm. And um, and and so I, you have to, I, I believe you have to show that both wings were, were right. in evidence. Um, but on the, but the philosophical one is important because mm -hmm. we've had the Bible for then 1800 years and we didn't have a free republic right. of this sort. So it took both wings. And, and that's exactly what the whole thing is to talk about. It's not either or, it's both working together, which it's makes it ends. unique. And here. that, I argue, was, a, was interestingly atypical for Protestants, you know, especially for mm -hmm. Calvinists, who, who have a tendency to exalt redemption and put down creation. I'm exaggerating a little mm -hmm. bit, but you get the point. Right. And they have a tendency to put down reason and exalt faith, to okay. accept Lord, uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior, and, and to, they say very disparaging things about reason. In this generation, the founders typically praised both, right. and they often took pleasure in the fact that whether you looked at reason or at faith, both made arguments for liberty. Right. And they felt very strengthened that we can't be all wrong if both the Bible and the philosophers tell us that liberty is the central thread of history. Right. That's an excellent point, and this is a fine book. Thank you. We are just out of time. Happy everybody, with you, Everybody will have to read it and see so much new information, at least for a lot of us who, who never heard the original stories of uh, all those wonderful founders and what they did believe. Speaking here again with Michael Novak, author of On Two Wings, yes. Humble Faith and Common Sense at the American Founding. It is published by Encounter Books. I'm Doug Keck. Check it out. Check us out next time right here on EWTN Bookmark.